Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Popcotter, and you're listening to Call Talk for October 27, 2023. Today's topic is Generative AI Best Practices for Your Contact Center Transformation. If you're listening live, we invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. Here's how you do it. You can email me at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at benchmarkportal.com any time of the day. And now, with that, I would like to introduce the host of the show, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Alan, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about AI, artificial intelligence, specifically generative AI best practices. And I'll be interviewing Jimmy Padilla of FloatBot. I'm delighted to welcome him to the show. How are you doing, Jimmy? I'm doing great, Bruce. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, great. Well, yeah, we're going to be really digging into some important areas for our listening audience here. Uh, Jimmy is a expert in generative AI-based conversational AI applications for contact centers. Uh, he's based in Sunnyvale uh, and is CEO and founder of Floatbot AI Worldwide. He completed a bachelor's in engineering from Virmata Bijabai Technological Institute in India, and I apologize if I uh, massacred that name, Jimmy, but Jimmy has worked at uh, General Electric as an IT project leader and graduated from GE's elite IMLP leadership program. He has over 18 years of experience in generative AI-powered conversational AI and digital transformation and customer facing contact center solutions, which is exactly what we here at Benchmark Portal uh, are specialized in and uh, our audience wants to hear about. So uh, there's a lot of buzz, Jimmy, and noise around generative AI. So let's dive right into it and try to decode that for contact center managers. Sure. I mean, and just to just to make it easy, uh, that was VJTI India. Yep, I mean, uh, was established by Queen Victoria back in 1887. The, the name mm-hmm. of the college, which then became Indianized by the name that you were trying to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> so just a fun fact. Thank, uh, thank you for helping me. Yeah, 1996. Yep, and uh, that's called Veer Mata Jijabai. She was the mother of great warrior, uh, uh, you know, uh, Maharaj Shivaji. But anyways, yeah, let's deep dive into Gen AI and and LLMs for the contact center. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah, could you just uh, help us to decode the buzz and the noise around generative AI uh, today, and then we'll go into some specifics. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, conversational AI, I mean, is, is not new in, in the contact center environment, right? It's been around for, I mean, I would say close to a decade now, uh, probably mm-hmm. more, yeah. more active in the last three to four years, right? right? What has changed in the last one year is, is this whole, you know, it's, it's, it's upscale. It's now become a lot more smarter with, uh, with this new technology, which, you know, is, is, is referred to as generative AI. But, but you know, I, I, would, I would technically, it's, 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 it's also called large language model. So mm-hmm. this is, I mean, you can say it's an advanced version of NLP, which is natural language processing, right? Those are the modules that were available, has been around for, for several years. So what has changed is with this large language model, you know, all of us, I mean, I think would have experienced uh, talking to ChatGPT or chatting with ChatGPT that was formally launched, I think, uh, end of last year. That's that's what has kind of, you know, made this, this whole space uh, a lot more uh, interesting now. Uh, you know, with so so this large language models are are typically trained on massive amount of data. Just imagine the the smallest one would have been trained around seven billion or ten billion parameters. The largest one, like ChatGPT four, would have been trained on two fifty billion parameters. That's like that's like immense amount of data, which just makes it mm-hmm. a lot smarter. It just, you know, and, and, and typically, I mean, this has been, we are one of the pioneers to apply this. Uh, and, under, uh, you know, I mean, for, for some of the interesting contact center use cases. So, mm-hmm. and okay. yeah, I mean, on both sides of automation, I mean, how it can automate some of the conversation and how it can assist to the contact center agents, basically. Right. And, uh, and those are, are big issues and uh, sort of big areas that people are very interested in. That is to say, assisting 
agents, and then also automating the entire process. And of course, the assistance part requires automation as well. So what are, in fact, you mentioned uh, that you've had a lot of experience with application of these concepts. So, so what are some of the applications you're seeing for contact centers with uh, generative AI and uh, LLM, sure. large language models? Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, you, I mean, yeah, both of them means the same thing, you know, large language model or gen AI. So what mm -hmm. we have, you know, f first of all, there are a lot of applications. Those are internal to contact centers, right, which could be just imagine assisting the agents real time. So when an agent is interacting with a customer, right, I mean, we have seen this. This could be a sales conversation. This could be a support conversation. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so generative AI or large language models can real time guide these agents on how to answer better. So essentially mm -hmm. making a level one agent, a level five agent, you know, coaching them real time, what's the next best answer, what's the next best question that you should ask, what are the I mean it, it can learn like like large language models can can learn from millions of documents. You know, for one of the uh, one of the customer uh, BPO customers and customer is uh, you know into into electronics hardware. So we trained it on 1.3 million documents where the AI has learned from from that past cases, knowledge based articles. And when when a customer is asking a question, you know, or, or reporting a problem, they immediately the agent can immediately see it, the answer on the screen, right? So those those are mm -hmm. some of the. I mean, then just imagine. So that's during the call, right? I mean, imagine. Uh, post call, so you know, co post call summarization, a lot of real time analytics now are driven by large language models. Uh, so you know, those are some of the applications that QA quality analysis uh, is also another application. Uh, so so essentially, you know, I mean, it, it has just made it a lot more smarter and easier to now now understand and and drive meaningful insights from massive amount of data. Uh, that could be in call center. It would mostly be in form of call or text, basically, right? Uh, so that's 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 a lot on internal facing use cases. And if I talk about external or customer facing use cases, you know, on, around the automation. So there's, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, chatbots or voice bots have been around, like what I said. It just has been, uh, you know, now they're just made a lot more smarter with with LLMs or Gen AI, right? So chatbot, I mean, chat like just like you're talking to ChatGPT, I mean our platform yeah. Floatbot.ai allows to you know have to custom build or or to 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 fine tune uh, such such LLMs for your specific business use cases that could be around mm -hmm. support, that could be around uh, sales, onboarding, etc. And now if customers can interact with that just like you are interacting with ChatGPT. On and so we have our proprietary models that will work on chat as well as voice, which means now they no longer are limited to chat, but also also can interact on a voice call as well. So those are some of the use cases on 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 internal facing and, and external customer facing. Right. One of the things that I might bring up here, because I was speaking at a conference this week, uh, and obviously among the topics were AI, and I had noticed that there's a fairly high anxiety level still among managers as to what it's all about and, um, you know, the generative AI, how it's going to impact them, et cetera. But the, the first thing is just understanding what it is, because it seems like magic to a lot of people. And what I tried to do, and apparently it worked at least for some people, was to say, look, what all is going on here is uh, technology that is recognizing patterns. And if you think about it that way, it becomes a little bit more understandable and less intimidating. In other words, yes, there's this technology that is able to go through immense amounts of data or potentially just your KMS system, Right. If you wanted to start that way, uh, you could just go through your KMS system so that you are making uh, answers available or assistance available to your agents so that you can come up with the best possible answer to their question or, as you noted in the sales case, uh, the best possible uh, you know, sales pos uh, propositions to them as well. 
And so it's looking for patterns. So don't get, don't be afraid of it. It's okay. It's good stuff. And uh, it will help you find those patterns because that's what the human mind does. Uh, but obviously this can do it in a more organized way. It does make mistakes sometimes. Uh, it will make fewer mistakes as time goes on and as it gets, uh, you know, corrected for any mistakes that it makes. But, uh, yeah, no, that's very valuable. And let me just ask, too, about if somebody is thinking about LLM and they say to themselves, what are some of the best practices that I should follow when I'm thinking about selecting an LLM for me? Should it be something that is for uh, KMS, you know, basically just takes the place of that and therefore uses the databases that are available inside my organization? Or should I uh, have something that's a wider net and that pulls in uh, immense amounts of data from outside as well? Just uh, some thoughts on that, uh, Jimmy. I hope that's not too big a question for you. No, absolutely, and thanks for sharing those insights. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> the first first of all, I mean, you know, uh, they should think of you know what use cases they want to, or what problems you know uh, that that as an organization you know we want to solve. Uh, like like some of the problems that that I can tell you we are solving or we are helping our customers solve is uh, reducing average you know AHTs average call call handling time right and and what you rightly pointed because agents are spending a lot of time finding the answers in KMS so I mean mm -hmm. if you if if AI can can get the answer in a fraction of a second that means that mm -hmm. agents no longer have to put the customers on hold. You know, they can, they'll just write away answer from, and they'll, they'll just see it on the screen and they'll answer it. So the other, other uh, some of the other use cases are compliance. Like, do you want to monitor what your agents are? And the customers are saying, is it compliant to your policy? Raise any compliance flags, et cetera. Uh, you know, the other, the other use cases, next best action, et cetera. So, so, so basically, essentially, it's important to list down these use cases. And you know, uh, also list down in the priority. Some of them could be low-hanging fruit, so it's a good idea to start from those. KMS uh, AI learning from KMS and answering is one of the most low-hanging fruits, so it's a good start. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. So after after you yeah after you have this use cases listed down, you know, I mean, you typically uh, also it's important to 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 kind of pick the right LLM there. So LLM is you know, it's not just one uh, one software module out there, right? It's not just one company that does that. There are there are like ChatGPT is just one of ten right now, right? So you have to see what what is the right uh, you know LLM for you uh, for the current use case as well as for ongoing use case uh, after a year or so, you know. So so for example, I'll give you uh, ChatGPT is is really smart but there's a latency involved for 5 to 10 to 15 seconds in giving answers so that means that you cannot deploy this for real time use cases you know uh, example your agents have to be real time assisted right i mean so the next best action cannot come from chat gpt because it would take 15 seconds to respond uh, so yeah i mean these are some of the things you know Driven from use cases, you have to. There are there are now closed source LLM, which which means a proprietary to some company. There are open source LLMs. We as as Floatbot.ai, we our platform allows to even fine tune LLM on your specific data. You know, so kind of optimizing the cost and latency, etc. So yeah, I mean, there's there's always to, you have to you have to think of use cases. You have to think uh, which LLM is right for you, and uh, and also what are the associated latency cost. Uh, you know, hallucination, like you mentioned, what percentage, how much would it hallucinate, uh, etc. Those are the factors that one should, one should consider. And to start with, uh, it would always be uh, data from within the organization. Uh, we have not seen any organization starting with a wider net of starting to look data from Internet. Right. That's, that's always uh, a kind of a strict uh, no-no. And Jimmy, if I could, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to compliance in a minute, but you, in, in talking about hallucination, just for those who are not as familiar with it, could you explain hallucination, just define it, and uh, then talk about how uh, how the industry is dealing with it these days? 
Yeah, so hallucination, I mean, it's interesting how, you know, before I talk about that, it's important I just talk briefly about when you are deploying a large language model-based bot for your organization, right? You are typically giving, uh, it's imagine you are giving instructions to an agent. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's as simple or as, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's little more than that, but on those lines. So typically to an AI agent, you know, you're coming and you're giving instruction in plain English, like within our platform, you can see what instructions are given. So, you know, you, you would start typically with, you know, that you are a chatbot or you are a voice bot for ABC company. You know, this if, if a customer asks this, these are the questions you're supposed to ask them back. Here is how you would validate. So it's like you're, you're, you are actually giving instructions in plain language, you know, as if you're giving it to an agent. Now, because those instructions would be very elaborate, right? I mean, and 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 uh, so just like an agent, which might tend to forget one of the instruction in between, it is possible that an AI agent, which is powered by large language models, etc., may hallucinate somewhere down the down the triage, right, where it's at seventh or eighth question. It is supposed to ask one, but it may it may hallucinate and instead skip that question, right? Mm-hmm. So that's. That's that's what is called hallucination, you know, where large language model misses out something, or tries mm-hmm. to inject a, inject something which it it is not supposed to. I mean, which it got it from it's because it's already trained on billions and billions of parameters. It injected something that it's not it 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 wasn't trained on. So that's that's what is called hallucination, and and that's that's an, that's that's something that you know it's very important when you pick an LLM to ask the vendor that you know. Can can I give a try? You know, you should you should yourself give a try to interact with five or ten bots that are built out of from that platform to see uh, is there any hallucination and how how those can be reduced. Okay, and that was a great explanation too because I think most people who are somewhat familiar with hallucination think of it injecting something that is it's not trained on and therefore it makes mistakes on. Uh, or there's problems with it. And you ma- mentioned as well that it could also miss things or uh, skip over things that it should be doing and hallucinate in that way as well. So uh, I think that was very, very useful there. And if I could just bring up the compliance part again, uh, because this is an area in which obviously hallucination or other issues with the uh, systems can be problematic. It's one thing if the compliance has to do with uh, internal policies that are important but perhaps not risky. And then uh, there's also compliance that has to do with laws and regulations that, in fact, could uh, bring lawsuits to the company and therefore have to be uh, curated and watched in, in, with more, more care. Now, do you want to talk about that uh, just a little bit, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, but so while I talked about hallucination, right? It's, it, mm-hmm. it it may sound scary, but it's it's not a not of not a big of problem because now there are, you know, platforms that are mature that are mature enough to handle those, build guardrails around it, you know. And mm-hmm. So 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 it's it's I would say it it could happen, you know, maybe sometimes out of a million million use cases. Right, but it's not of a major problem, and there are ways to tackle that. Uh, but from a compliance perspective, right? I mean, uh, just you know, I mean, uh, it's it, that's that's the reason a lot of customers they they kind of tend to uh, stick to you know what what we recommend is for such such high compliance use cases is rather than going for a generic kind of a large language model, you know, go for a, a custom LLM, which is very, very specific, fine-tuned on highest amount of accuracy. And mm-hmm. it, it, for example, for that those models, it's okay to say that I don't know the answer, uh, you know, if it's not knowing rather than saying something else. So there are ways to tackle that. And, you know, I mean, we are right now deploying this for large insurance carriers, large bank uh, banking organizations, and I think the value that it brings uh, is way more than the, the the hallucination problem. And so far, I would say that for heavily, heavily compliant organization, yes, then it would make sense to have it internal to assist their agents to start with and then maybe start thinking of the more self-service kind of use cases. 
Right, right. And those use cases, when necessary, uh, may have to be sort of uh, plugged into your legal team as well. Hopefully not, but that does, that is something that uh, you have to be think, thinking about if you're in a heavily regulated area and there are uh, heavy fines and, and other uh, problems that can come yeah, out of and it I mean, if you just don't to, do just things right. I mean, I mean we, yeah, we haven't thought about it, but there could be, you know, terms and conditions that may come around where, mm -hmm. you know, it would say that, you know, where which customer they've already agreed to that, you know, that in case – the company may say that you know if you do you do allow company to deploy AI agents to interact with you, and if at all it may hallucinate one out of million times, then you mm -hmm. know <laughs> yeah. then you know you right. you would exempt us or whatever, right? So I think those yeah. I mean those are more of le legal things which I I'm sure just like an AI just like an agent may mistake uh, may mistake make mistake, but AI agent can as well. But the chances are a lot lesser. But I, right. I, I definitely that's a legal compliance side, and uh, we haven't. So we're working with some large government-backed carriers as well. Uh, mm -hmm. We haven't. I think it's transparently told when they're talking with customers that, hey, I am an AI agent, you know, representing this company, which which means that the customer is talking to an AI bot. You know, it's transparently told that, and it's and 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 because customers, are, I mean, they, they, those are deployed to make the life of customer easier to reduce the wait time, which means that you know customers are okay with that. Right, right, exactly. Okay. Well, let me ask you uh, kind of a softball question, but one that I think a lot of people have on their minds because I've heard it a lot myself, which is how much data is required to train LLM? And here, feel free to, uh, you know, peel the onion as much as you need for different use cases in different situations. How much data yeah, is so, required? So, first of all, you know, again, boils down to the use cases. Uh, so, for example, if you're talking about KMS, then mm -hmm. only and only your KMS data is enough, you know, to get the right answer from the KMS. You know, if that's the mm -hmm. use case, you know, this could be a KMS with uh, 100,000 questions or a million questions or a, a million document. I mean, that's that's all one needs, mm -hmm. right, to to get to to give most accurate answer around it. But you know, when we talk about, I mean, and and that is actually hardly uh, there's absolutely no hallucination in that as well right mm -hmm. i mean when we talk about hallucination when we talk about additional data to train this llm those those i mean those use cases are more conversational just imagine that uh, uh uh you know customer onboarding right i mean a customer has to be uh, a bot has to ask uh, or maybe uh, when we are assisting the agents for a very complex conversation, right, the next best action. So it's very conversational, very contextual, based on the, the series of, con I mean, you know, the talks that just happened between agent and customer or between the customer and bot. Bot is kind of guiding them with the next best question, answer, et cetera, right? So these are, this is very, very conversational kind of, uh, uh, you know, use case. In that, in that scenario, uh, what we recommend, I mean, is obviously – uh, depending on the LLM you pick, uh, so for example, if you pick uh, like OpenAI's ChatGPT, uh, you they they don't allow to fine tune at all. I mean, you know, there's there's one version that is allowed to fine tune, uh, but but yeah, so uh, but otherwise it's it's quite a closed loop. Uh, but otherwise, you know, what we do is we have our own LLMs which we can fine tune on customers' data. And typically, we take about five thousand to ten thousand calls, you know, past calls that that happened between agent and the customer, or it could be a chat transcript, you know. So uh, then we kind of uh, uh, feed it to the LLM to to fine tune that for and make it, uh, you know, make it highly highly accurate uh, to drive those conversations basically. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, again, so that's that's what I would say. Uh, and not not in all scenarios you need to fine tune. It's uh, it's relatively expensive to fine tune an LLM. Uh, so, so depending on the use case, if it's KMS, you don't need at all. If it's driving conversations, right, then it makes sense to uh, to fine tune LLM and, and platforms like us, uh, like I mean, we have a module which where you can just load the data and and, and click on a button and then you know in back end it would keep running for 24 to 48 hours and it would just mm -hmm. find you in that LLM. Yeah. So, so I would say more conversational uh, use cases would require fine tuning, 
KMS would not. If you just want to summarize a call, you don't need to fine tune. Uh, you just, I mean, so basically there are two layers of using an LLM. One is the, the layer which is fine tuning what you told, you know, which is relatively expensive. And above that is a layer called prompt engineering. So most of the most of the use cases, you know, like call summarization and KMS, et cetera, can be resolved. You don't need to touch the LLM. You just need to give the right prompts, right instructions, like I mentioned earlier, and and you may be able to get the job done. Okay. Great, great input there. Great input there, Jimmy. So we're getting toward the end of our time together, unfortunately. I think we could keep going all day. But uh, let's sort of uh, blue sky about the future here for a second, just so that people uh, on the call can be thinking about this as well. Because obviously you want to have uh, flexibility to change LLM in the future uh, to sort of grow with AI. And so I was wondering if you could share with us your ideas on this uh, so that people don't, you know, find themselves thinking, oh, gosh, am I going to be messing up my future by not thinking about this now? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and just, just before that, I'll quickly talk about a minute that, you know, when you choose a platform, you should, uh, you know, have that flexibility to change the LLM or point it to another LLM down the mm -hmm. line, you know, in case you need it so that you don't get locked in a large language model because most of these large companies, right, I mean, most of the scalers, they have their own LLMs and they lock you down in that part. So if you have, imagine you have spent a lot of time and money on, on building a bot with all the integrations, with integrating with applications, and, and, and if you lock, lock you down with that only one LLM, you know, tomorrow or, or a month, uh, or, you know, six months later, uh, if there is another LLM which is performing better and if you don't have that option to change it, then you know you are locked in that ecosystem, and then it, you have to then redo that effort to build the bot on on some other LLM. So I would say that's very important that you know you pick a platform that allows you that flexibility to pick and choose the LLM whenever you uh, you want. I mean, we we give that flexibility to to do that. And now, you know, talking about the future, I think uh, you know it's it's here to stay. So uh, I think every organization right now. Is uh, is allocating some time and energy to see what are the use cases that they can either leverage to either automate the conversation or they can assist their existing process or agents with this com conversation. I mean, if you're not doing it, your competitor is doing it. You know, so to maintain that, uh, you know, that edge in the market, it probably would be would get to a must in by 2024. Okay, great. Jimmy, listen, those were great insights. Really, we thank you very much for coming on the show to share these thoughts with our audience. And um, so what I'd like to do at this point is to uh, give you an opportunity for uh, a last word if you have it. Otherwise, we'll turn things over to Alan to wrap things up. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, what, what I think is definitely it's, it's a great addition to Contact Center uh, environment. Jenny, I, it's it's something that uh, you know everyone should evaluate, which can help them to to increase their margins, reduce their cost, and also increase the customer experience. I mean, we are talking about automating 70 to 80 percent of conversation in few scenarios, versus also increasing agents' productivity by up to 40, 50 percent in very complex or more highly compliant regulatory environment. So either of the cases, I think it's a great value addition and to, to bring to drive those business metrics. So that's, right. that's what I would have to say. Yeah. Okay. Listen, thank you very much, Jimmy. We really appreciate it. And with that, I'll hand things over to Alan Potcotter to wrap things up. Thanks again to Jimmy and to Bruce for your takeaways, your takeaways on today's show. Be sure to join us next month for another great show or look at our huge selection of archive shows on Hot Topic at BenchmarkPortal.com. Then click on Call Talk where you'll find over 14 seasons of this show. From all of us at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Alan Pockotter signing up. Have a great day. Uh -huh.